Welcome to Outside Sales Talk, where we meet with industry experts to learn the strategies and tactics that make them successful. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and I've helped thousands of salespeople all over the world crush their quota. Today, I'll help you crush yours. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, I've got Jamie Shanks on the line here. Uh, Jamie's going to talk about spear selling, tackling account-based sales. Jamie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Well, just by way of introduction, Jamie is CEO of Sales for Life, the world's definitive social selling training and coaching company. He is a world-leading social selling expert and responsible for pioneering the space. Jamie is the author of Spear Selling, the ultimate account-based sales guide for the modern digital sales professional. Really excited for this one, Jamie. Let's jump into it. Uh, you wrote a book titled Spear Selling. Can you describe what spear selling is and why is it important? Yeah, I appreciate it. Basically, this is an acronym that's, that is standing for Select, Plan, Engage, Activate Accounts, and then Run or Replace Accounts. And the reason I created it is I helped evangelize and pioneer a type of modern digital selling. It's basically called social selling in most circles. And what had happened as sellers became social sellers, they became magnets and inbound sellers. And unfortunately, in mid-market and enterprise companies, they can't live only on their inbound leads. They have to go outbound. And those territories could be geographic or they could be vertical in nature. But ultimately, the sellers need a plan to prospect and develop their own pipeline. And our customer base was longing for this pipeline creation curriculum that we devised and we needed to teach people how to fish. And so ultimately that's why I wrote Spear Selling two years after I wrote Social Selling Mastery, which was around the foundations of becoming a modern digital seller, but it didn't dive enough into account-based selling. Got it. So it's almost like if social selling was fishing with a net, Spear Selling is fishing with a spear. Spear, exactly. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so, uh, well, how specifically does a sales manager learn, coach, manage, and lead an outside sales professional using digital and social selling and, and spear selling? How do, you, how do they do that? What's your advice to a sales manager? Yeah, if you were to think of a journey of uh, improving the skills and capabilities of a sales team, along that journey, companies today, many of them still think as social selling or modern digital selling as a secondary activity. So it's like, here are the things that we've done in the past, like phone and email and face-to-face -face meetings. Oh, and by the way, we should do this social selling thing. What happens in that evolution, eventually companies realize that this is just sales and that they look at their sales process and there's a way to improve and complement the way that they're going to market today, known as a sales motion, and that they can incrementally improve their ability to uh, target accounts. Why are they targeting those accounts? Be able to plan with greater structure and rigor, and then ultimately engage the customer in a bold and different way. And so as a frontline sales manager, you become the catalyst to coaching. And our job as a training, coaching, and consulting company is to give you not only the framework, but the play-by-play the -play on what you do to ask in your one-on-one -on -one those tough questions to say, are you doing the right activities that highly influence sales objectives? So how can an outside sales professional rethink their account selection to increase their opportunity conversion and velocity? It's probably the most important piece to outbound prospecting or pipeline creation. And I don't think enough is, uh, is being leveraged, the average seller is just not leveraging this as part of their motion. What's happening is an account executive or a sales professional looks at their territory, again, geography or vertical, and starts building lists. Those lists, when you really peel back the onion, is something we call wallet share-based thinking, meaning that they selected the accounts based on the potential revenue, the number of employees, the brand cachet, but none of those attributes give you what we call an asymmetrical competitive advantage, meaning there is no more advantage you have to win that account 
let's just assume that your product is fairly like-minded to your competitor, then your competitors. So what we help you rethink is that relationships are the one competitive advantage that people can't take from you. So what if you actually took your existing customer base and reverse engineered it and basically thought customer outward and, and started to map the relationships between your existing advocates, your existing customers, and how they could influence deals in a territory. Are there people that have changed jobs from an existing customer of yours and moved on to a new account? Are there key stakeholders that you deal with every day in your customer base that could introduce you to somebody in that organization and give you a leg up on the competition? That's the basis of what we call the sphere of influence, which is part of the account selection process that has truly changed the game for sales professionals. They are now, they actually have a why to the story of why are you going after that account and going to spend the next six to 12 months on that account. And yeah, in my experience, there are a few things more powerful than, than getting those introductions, getting those referrals. Um, so that, that makes a tremendous amount of sense to me. Um, it's, re it's a really interesting thought to build your account list around where you could generate referrals. That's, that's a really cool approach, I think. Yeah, and it's unfortunately overlooked. And I, I've been in boardrooms where, and I, I love telling this one particular story. I, I was speaking at a sales kickoff and I pulled a sales professional up on stage and I said, show me your top five accounts you're working on right now. The sales professional said, I'm going to target Peloton, the actual you know, uh, elliptical bike company that, that, yep. you know, that sits in your basement. Mm -hmm. So essentially, then I asked him, why? Why are you going after that account? His eyes diverted to the SVP of sales and he said, well, the SVP of sales in our company rides a Peloton every day and said it would be a great fit for our business. So if you really thought about it from a customer-centric standpoint, there is no advantage that the company I was working with had to win Peloton over anybody else. But there are others in the health and wellness space, if they took their existing customer base, drew a circle around them, there are people in that health and wellness space that they have an asymmetrical competitive advantage to be able to activate that account, engage them, or engage them, activate them, and ultimately run with them into an opportunity. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. So there's a lot of buzz in, uh, in the world of sales and marketing right now around account-based marketing. And, uh, you know, the, I guess talk to me a little bit about where does account-based marketing stop and account-based sales start? How are, what's the relationship here? Is this kind of a similar uh, philosophy of approaching, approaching accounts and how do you differentiate them? So we'll talk about uh, what standard operating procedure or like kind of core performing companies would do. And then I'll talk about what best in class would do. Okay. So in a kind of core performing or standard operating business, an account based sales development motion is what are the accounts I, the account executive, the sales professional, what am I going to work on as my top 10 accounts, my strategic 25 accounts? What is my plan? What is my engagement strategy? and I keep myself accountable to that engagement. And I may leverage marketing to help me develop insights and assets that I could use in my stories to customers to push them off their status quo. And what account-based marketing is doing in the background is nurturing, engaging all the potential key stakeholders in that account. That's kind of the basics of it. If you really were to think of what best in class looks like, Best in class is a company that considers marketing and sales all on one team called team revenue. And at the end of the day, they may have all different job functions equally important to serving the customer. And so what happens is the sales professional says, these are the 10 or 25 or 100 accounts that are most important to us to win over the next couple of years in my total addressable market. Marketing. How can we work together to build an account plan, build storyboards of our engagement strategy, and then execute those sales plays against the customer? And we've seen sales plays that range from using online tools like LinkedIn to drive people to local events. And those local events is where marketing and sales shine in bringing together customers. We've seen it where one of my favorites was in Brussels, Belgium, where 
a company called Showpad invited all these chief revenue officers onto a huge bus. And on the bus was a DJ, Belgium beer, and chief revenue officers on this one bus. And together they drove around tech company by tech company around Brussels and learned best practices. You know, they would talk about CRM integration. One would be about how to build inside sales teams. And basically throughout the day, these chief revenue officers got a master's degree in what does best in class look like? Well, the sales professional didn't just put this event on by themselves. They partnered with marketing to say, hey, how do we get all of Belgium's best chief revenue officers in one room? I've got an idea. Beer, bus, DJ. Boom, put them together. And so they partnered. <clears throat> and so ultimately, the best in class see it as we are all accountable to winning these accounts. How do we develop the plan, the engagement strategy, the sales place, and then execute those plays to get people meeting each other, boardroom meetings, whatever we need to do. That sounds great. I, I love it. What, uh, what, are the, what are the critical account planning details that a modern digital seller, digital seller captures in order to activate an account? What's, what's, what are the really important key pieces of data? There are four pillars that I and our customers, account executives, would look for. And those four pillars are triggers, referrals, insights, and competitive intelligence. So I'll kind of touch on each one of those. Trigger, I'll give you a real life example. Uh, a trigger would be a job change, is one form of a trigger. When an advocate of yours leaves an existing customer of yours, moves on to an account you haven't yet to win, that's a reason to reach out, right? In that first 90 days, what is your game plan? Congratulations on your new job. What's your game plan at your new company? That's a trigger. Next is referrals, and this is obvious. I can drop into your social network. Imagine you were a customer of mine. I can drop into your social network and reverse engineer. Show me every CEO in your social network that you know, and show me every CEO that you know in San Francisco. And it allows me to map your social proximity to CEOs. That's, and I can ask, I can run a sales play against those referrals. Next, competitive intelligence. This is poorly used by most companies, but the, the best in class use this as an account deselection or de-emphasizer. Imagine if I was uh, an account executive at a software company and I had five major competitors. I could actually take my total addressable market or territory and plug into LinkedIn everyone that has my competitor's name somewhere on their LinkedIn profile. I can also reverse engineer every past employee of my competitors. Where do they work today? Because if any of those people are in the IT departments or HR, depending on what I sell, finance, and they're close to you know, an economic decision maker or they could be a real what I call a poison pill or a detractor in the account, I need to really rethink my time spent on that account. Mm -hmm. So I, can, I, I take all these software companies, I map where people work, and I think, how close are these people to being able to influence the velocity of my deal? Are they, you know, are they middle management and they don't even know about this deal? Or are they the chief operating officer, and when the PO or the statement of work comes on their desk, they're just going to put a giant X on this and say, we're not going to use that company. I used to work over at X, Y, and Z. We'll bring in my old friends and we'll bring in the deal. So that's competitive intelligence. And then the last is insights. Insights is not just content. Insights are ideas and strategies that truly teach customers something new. There's a, a study done by Forrester and with, in joint conjunction with corporate visions. And it showed that 74% of deals are awarded to the sales professional or team, not just the company, but the people, that were first to provide value and insight in the deal. Just like the movie Inception. Plant a seed in somebody's mind, let it germinate. And so basically these four pillars I use to build my structured plan against that account. Am I going to engage with a trigger, a referral? Am I even gonna go after this account because competitive intelligence? And then what are the insights I could teach these people that they don't already know? That's the plan. So 
in terms of making in, in terms of making this actionable um how how would you well, i guess walk me through how you recommend a salesperson engage new key accounts so how how would you how should how should a salesperson make that approach what are some strategies what what should they actually do okay so imagine i now have my plan what's my now what i do is i take all that knowledge and i take a sheet of paper and I pretend like I'm building a storyboard. Storyboards exactly like if you were writing a script for a movie or a TV show or a book. And take five square boxes, draw five square boxes on a sheet of paper and think of it, if I were gonna tell a customer stories over the next month or two or quarter, what am I gonna tell them? And this, again, is another failure. Sales professionals will plug in an email template into sales loft or outreach IO, and then they'll engage the customer. And when you really look at the engagement strategy, they're saying the same thing five times with different words. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to think, okay, touch point number one, I'm going to tell them the story about a case study of a customer that they used to work at. Okay. So I'm going to tell them a high social proximity, sphere of influence story, because they used to work at that company. If that play doesn't work, three days later, I'm going to actually show them a study that we did that stack ranked them against their competition and against best in class. And if that play doesn't work, then three days later, I'm gonna tell them a story about what the market of the human resources, let's say we were selling to HR, the future chief human resources officer, what their role will look like by the year 2020 and 2025. And I'll, I'll uh, show a video that might talk to them about what the best looks like. And if that doesn't work, and I've got more and more of these sales plays, I actually am engaging, and I haven't talked about the mechanisms of engaging, but what I've done is I've, divided, I've devised stories that my competitors just aren't doing. I'm, I am what challenger sale would call teach, tailor, take control. I am going to be the first to give them insights so they go, like nobody's ever talked to me like this. That's what I'm going to do. And so how do you make that approach? Do you recommend, um, I guess in a, in a perfect world, you've got a referral into an account, but let's just say you, there's an account that you, that you know about and it seems like a great fit for you, but you don't necessarily have a clean way in. What, how do you, how do you engage with that account with this type of material that you're, that you're talking about? Do you do it through LinkedIn? Do you do it with the phone? Do you do it? Um, uh, drop him by the office. Do you send him an email? How do you do it? So uh, in, in throughout my sales place, I will use any and all mechanisms or means of communication called like modalities of communication. But what I will do first is whether it's through email or it's through um, LinkedIn, let's assume I used phone and that didn't work. I'm going to use the power of video. I am not going to send a written email. I'm going to send a video email. I am not going to send a written LinkedIn message. I'm going to send a video message. And there's all kinds of studies done that have shown uh, it reduces sales cycles, it increases uh, uh, read and response rates and click rates and you know, opportunity creation rates. But the reason I'm using video is two reasons. One, I humanize myself. People buy from people. So uh, my video is going to demonstrate I am not a robot. I am not a random company reaching out to you. I'm a human who has targeted you for a specific reason. Number two, you can tell that I talk like 500 words a minute. I can synthesize all these ideas in 60 seconds in a way that, and convey it in a way that you know, a written email just couldn't do it justice. And, and you're yeah. saying what kind of email, what kind of video are you talking about here? Are you talking about like a a professionally produced video that is generic to many customers? Or are you talking about you're whipping out your iPhone and taking a, a video of, of yourself speaking directly to this customer by name and, or, or are you using software to do this or something in between? So the latter. Uh, and now I typically use a tool uh, free and available for the individual sales professional. It's called Vidyard Go Video. And now then, of course, like every other software, there's an enterprise version of it, but it allows me to make two types of videos. One, just like what we're doing right now, face-to-face -face video telling you a story. Second mm -hmm. is like a screen in screen. So in the bottom left-hand corner, it shows me talking, but I could be showing you something that's on my desktop right now. Mm -hmm. Or, of course, 
the iPhone idea. What they are not is some professional grade video because that's not needed because that's not real life. And I take one take. And because if I were on a conference call or a phone call, I only get one take. And so, yes, I will stutter, ums, ahs, murmurs. That's reality of sales. And I want you to realize that I'm authentic and I'm here to help you. Uh, so take one take, send it to the customer. Okay, so that was that, that uh, Canadian company, I've heard of them, Vidyard, V-I-D-E-Y-A-R-D, you're recommending? Vidyard Go Video, yeah. Vidyard Go Video, and that's, okay. an extension that you can download. Okay, and I, and I, I think I've seen, um, they have a competitor, and I think they're called Gong.io. Is it this? Wait. Gong, Gong is um, a software that monitors phone conversations for mm. inclinations, cadences. It's like artificial intelligence for our phone conversation. Yeah. They have competitors, obviously. Um, so there's these like minded tools that allow you to make videos. Mm -hmm. And the video is compressed into a hyperlink, and that hyperlink can be shared using any medium email social messages and so forth text mm -hmm. messages i've used it where i've made videos and if you're if, if if your listeners are in latin america amia apac i make these videos and i can send it via whatsapp right the it, the method of communication is specific to the market so if, when i'm in asia or i'm in um, amia i'll use whatsapp but i still want to humanize myself so i'll make a video very cool um so, uh, is it bomb 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 bomb? That might be one I I've heard of bomb bomb. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just, I, I, I just looked it up on, on Google here, but I've, I definitely heard of both of those companies. And so definitely worth, I mean, video, customized video is definitely a powerful tool. I mean, I, and, and one that I think hasn't been played out yet, you know, like not everyone's kind of jumped on the bandwagon, so it's still fresh enough to work. Um, now that being said, this is, this is how you would approach one account if you thought it was just a great fit for you. What, what about, uh, how does spear, spear selling deal with more, if you had a thousand accounts, these are your thousand accounts, you've just been given a new territory. How do you approach a thousand accounts uh, with, with this methodology? Or First thing that I would do is I need to be able to map my total addressable market and segment accounts from, you know, and some of our customers would call them A, B, C's and D's and there's a quadrant. Mm -hmm. Some might have them as passive opportunities, inactive opportunities, whatever it is. I need to build a pie chart of my total addressable market. Here's what I would do. I need to introduce myself to those thousand accounts and I'll give you a real life example of our global, our curriculum's global at Microsoft as an example. So, all these sellers are using our social sign mastery. There's a great sales professional in their Costa Rica office, number one producer named Priscilla. And what she does is you can make videos or you could use a tool like LinkedIn's Point Drive, which is a free and available tool inside LinkedIn Sales Navigator. Think of it as a micro site that you can build uh, with rich media. Long and the short is I would use these tools to do propensity to buy scoring. What I'm doing is mapping my total addressable market for who's engaged in my content. So you, the individual seller, can be autonomous of your marketing department. You don't need your marketing automation data. Make a video or create a custom LinkedIn point drive that has these great assets about your market, market trends, your product, and so forth. Distribute them out to your customer base. From there, you can monitor Who's clicking? Who's engaged? What are they watching? What are they looking at? And it allows me to segment my accounts. That's the first thing that you need to do is figure out who has buying intent and who doesn't. And then adjust your activity level, like Pareto's law, 80% of my activity goes towards the engaged accounts, 20% of my activity goes towards the non-engaged accounts. And in, in essence, that's almost like the difference between account-based sales development and account-based marketing. The accounts that aren't engaged, I'll put on a nurture path, or we call a learning path, that will we'll continue to teach them, but I'm not going to spend hours of horsepower on those accounts. I'm going to focus in on the, you know, what Chet Holmes' pyramid would show that 3% of a market is ready to buy today, another 7% is you know, actively looking. So mm -hmm. that 10% of the market, 
that's where I'm focusing my time. I'm using tools like video, like LinkedIn point drive to aid me in determining who cares. Really powerful strategy. I mean, and this is something that any salesperson can do. I, I, I really like it. Um, so what I guess what I'd like to do now is, is into the next section called sales in 60 seconds. So this is where I, I ask you questions that in theory you'll finish in 60 seconds. I can do this. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so tell me what sales processes are most affected by the changes in technology today? The sales processes. Ooh, great question. I would say the biggest processes that's being affected by technology is the process of pipe. I mean, the, whether it's call me a hammer and nails, it's pipeline development. Technology has given so much ability for companies to figure out who to target and how to target. Uh, but unfortunately, most sales professionals are not taking advantage of these tools to aid in their prospecting efforts. Tell me, how can salespeople use digital sales to maximize their time spent in the field? Interesting. Your account selection process is going to highly correlate between, to the accounts that you're able to activate and, and run with. Ultimately, if you were to look at your conversion of sales qualified leads to opportunities and so forth, so much prospecting time is being spent on the wrong accounts. I highly recommend that if you learn to leverage relationships as a guardrail to giving you a competitive advantage into accounts, you will activate accounts that your competitors can't. That means that you're in more pitches, you're in more proposals, you're in more boardrooms and more opportunities because you're using your own customer base to help you get in those boardrooms. Do you have any daily habits or routines that salespeople can use to be more productive? Greatest habit that I ever picked up, a CEO five years ago told me, when you get up in the morning and you grab your phone off your nightstand, do not check your email. Email are other people's priorities, not your own. Take that same time period, five, 10 minutes, to consume new insights. I use a tool called Feedly, which is a, a blog aggregator, and we have an internal tool called Everyone's Social. And I take content, I read it, and I share it with my social network. So I become the teacher every day to my you know, total addressable market. And it's changed people's vantage point of, of us. They, they, they've seen us as this lighthouse to best practices rather than me just responding to other people's queries on email. Very cool insight. Um, what's, a, what's a common mistake that reps should avoid in in the world of digital sales to, uh, in order to, if they wanted to increase their sales efficiency? I would say the biggest mistake is while they might know the account they want to engage, they have absolutely no idea how to build an engagement strategy that actually is bold, different, pushes people off their status quo. They tell the same boring stories over and over again, thinking that they're going to get a different response. They don't, realize that you need to step back and build a story, a story that connects with people. And then it, use tools like video to engage people in a way that really kind of shakes them and says, wow, I, I need to listen to this person. Awesome. Well, given that you're an expert in digital sales, what's your best advice that you would like to give our listeners? Uh, best advice is to be open-minded. Uh, I stumbled into modern digital selling because I started a consulting company that failed and I needed to improve my own prospecting. And I adjusted to modern digital selling as a means to serve me, but ultimately I started teaching other people. Be open-minded that the way that you're selling today isn't necessarily the way that's going to be affected, effective tomorrow or a year from now. Think of these tools and these processes as an evolution and be willing to try new things. Incredible advice. As a final takeaway, what should the field salespeople listening today do as a first step to get started in account-based selling? First step is to rethink your account selection process. It, right now we're recording this at the end of February 
And if you had a fiscal year that's a calendar year, the reality is in March and April, for most people, is the most important business development time period to set up the whole year because your sales cycles might be six months from now. So the people you're going to spend your time with, the accounts you're going to spend your time with in the next six to eight weeks are going to highly influence the rest of your year. Rethink that. Take a look at the accounts you said were the top 10 accounts you're going to go after and ask yourself a simple question, why? And what advantage did you have that other people don't? And use your own customer base as a lighthouse to kind of reverse engineer and say, can anyone in our customer base help us in this account? Well, that, that's fantastic as well. Um, this has been a really valuable episode. I. I am going to do my best to summarize this for all the people that are driving, uh, et cetera, and couldn't take notes. Um, first of all, spear selling is an acronym for selection, planning, engaging, activating, running. These terms break down how to effectively use account-based selling. Account-based selling helps you figure out why you're going after certain accounts and then really helps you focus your efforts on those accounts. Salespeople really need to plan to prospect and develop their own pipeline, and the Spear selling philosophy can help with this. Sales managers need to work on coaching sales reps on focusing in on account-based selling. Sales managers can work to improve the capabilities of their sales teams uh, with, by working on how to target these specific accounts, uh, why to target certain accounts, and how to work with those customers. In account-based selling, salespeople should focus on figuring out their top accounts, building an account plan for each one, and executing sales plays to build the relationship. Account-based marketing works with the sales team to develop the plan that the sales team needs and, and uses to aid their sales efforts. So I guess that's, that's the key difference is that the account-based selling is, is being supported by the account-based marketing. It's almost like the, you know, the air cover, you know, in a military engagement, I guess. <laughs> um, so there are, there are four pillars that help build a structured plan for a customer or an account. These pillars are triggers, referrals, insights, and competitive intelligence. These pillars help salespeople best reach out to their prospects at the right time and in a targeted way. You can work on building a storyboard to build a complete plan for a customer. Think of a, a timeline of engagement for a customer. Give them insights that no one else is giving through these stories. Use different channels to communicate these stories. Jamie recommends if you're using email to make first contact, uh, to send a video in that email. Send out videos as a tool for the account selection process. This will put you way ahead of other reps who aren't trying out new ways to prospect. Using video can help you activate your account faster and build the relationship before you meet in person. Um, and one video solution that we, uh, that you mentioned was that, that has a free kind of freemium version is Vidyard and uh, bomb bomb is another one that, that jumped to my mind that I've seen doing things of this nature. I think I saw their, uh, I saw their CEO speak at a, at a conference at one point, maybe a year ago. Um, so tell me, Jamie, uh, this, is, this has been awesome advice. Uh, where can listeners read more about your work? How do they reach out to you? Um, tell me about, tell, tell us how to do that. Yeah, please connect with me on LinkedIn or you can follow me on LinkedIn. I'm constantly sharing best practices. Uh, from a book standpoint, you can get it on Amazon or go to getspearselling.com. On Amazon, we have it in all the formats, you know, Audibles, Kindle, hard and soft cover. And then our company is called Sales for Life. And Sales for Life is, you know, the definitive place uh, for training, consulting, and coaching uh, on prospecting for modern digital sales. 
Very cool. Um, well, this has been a great episode of Outside Sales Talk. If anyone can think of any other sales reps that would benefit from learning from learning this skill that we've talked about here, share the love and forward this on to them. Take care until next time.